In this module, we are going to talk about cancer and neoplasm. So, neoplasm is, means new growth, and um, basically it's just another word for uh, tumor or cancer. And it's a big issue because cancer can happen in any system of the body. So, um, in some of the systems we talked about last quarter, um, definitely tumors were um, some of the pathologies and disorders and then some more of the systems that we're going to talk about this quarter are, um, are susceptible to cancer as well. So because cancer is widespread and lots of different causes, it takes a lot of different things to fight it. So there's certainly some types of cancer that have a better prognosis than others, some of them that have a more clear um, treatment plan and a more likely good outcome. So um, we're just first going to start out talking about sort of the basics of cancer and um, then we're in the next section we're going to start talking about cancer treatment and a little bit of what we can do as um, PTAs to um, help people with their cancer treatment. So terminology, of course we always got to start with that. Um, so when we talk about cell differentiation, um, each cell type differentiates and carries out particular functions. So um, we talked about how all of the cells in our body except the gametes have the same um, DNA complement, the same genotype. Um, but then each cell differentiates to become functional in its particular tissue or organ and the structure of the cell reflects the function of the tissue. So liver cells are going to be different from kidney cells and kidney cells are going to be different from pancreatic cells um, and the structure reflects the function of that individual tissue. So the mitosis is um, part of the cell cycle where the cell divides and it requires um, genetic control. The DNA and the RNA of the cell um, control the mitosis. Um, so a mutation happens if the DNA in the parent cell is altered and passed on, then the offspring cells will carry the mutation. So there are lots of different things that can cause mutations, um, and we'll talk a little bit about that. Um, we've talked about apoptosis before. It's programmed cell death, and it's caused by genetic elements. There's some genetic control that tells the cell, well, it's time, it's time to go, you're, you're done, and um, the cell uh, self-destructs, basically. So, <clears throat> a neoplasm, or tumor, is cellular growth that no longer responds to normal genetic controls. So, the cell continues to reproduce without the need for them to reproduce. So, it's sort of like an overgrowth of the cell. Um, when you get that overgrowth, or tumor, it deprives other cells in the area of nutrition because it's taken up all the um, resources because it's overgrowing. So a lot of times neoplasms um, have atypical or immature cells. So the cells are growing so fast that they don't have time to differentiate into a functional cell for that area. The characteristics of each tumor are going to depend on the type of cell from which the tumor arises and the unique structure and growth pattern of that individual tumor. And we'll talk about different types of tumors. So <clears throat> benign tumors, they have the tissue name plus the suffix oma. So like um, a glandular benign tumor is going to be called an adenoma. So um, malignant tumors or cancers have the tissue name plus the suff suffix carcinoma. So a, a malignant tumor of that same tissue would be an, an adenocarcinoma. Um, tumors of connective tissues are usually termed sarcomas and are often malignant. So that's of a, um, any kind of connective tissue or bone is considered a connective tissue. Um, there are several specific types of malignant tumors that have unique names like Hodgkin's disease, Wilms tumor, and leukemia. Those are um, specific types that have a name that only describes that particular tumor. So here's some examples of the tumor nomenclature. Um, so a lipoma, fatty tissue is, is lip, 
um, a benign is oma, so a lipoma is a benign tumor of fatty tissue. Um, a glandular tissue is adeno, a malignant epithelial um, tissue is a carcinoma, so an adenocarcinoma is a malignant tumor of epith epithelial lining of a gland. Um, fibrous tissue is fibro, a malignant connective tissue is sarcoma, so a fibrosarcoma is a malignant tumor of fibrous tissue. So you can, by the um, name of the tumor, you can tell where it is and what type it is, whether it's benign or malignant. So benign tumors um, are usually differentiated cells that reproduce at a higher rate than normal. Um, they're normally encapsulated, meaning they don't um, infiltrate into surrounding tissues. And any tissue damage that they cause is a result of compression of adjacent structures. This can be life-threatening in areas like the brain or the kidney, where it um, completely blocks off um, adjacent structures. Um, malignant tumors, they're usually undifferentiated non-functional cells. So um, there's something weird about them. They're not working. Um, they, they rapidly reprodu reproduce. They have abnormal my, uh, meiotic figures, meaning they're reproducing before they're ready to reproduce. Every one of them is a mutation. Um, they infiltrate or spread into surrounding tissues so they're not encapsulated like a benign tumor. And they can spread to distant sites. And the spread to a distant site is called metastasis. So malignant tumors have the potential to get out of the area that they're in and spread around. So here's a little graphic from the book that shows the um, um, difference between a benign, a benign tumor and a malignant tumor. So the cells in a benign tumor are relatively normal. They're not freaks like the ones in a malignant tumor. They're just growing faster than normal. And it's a slowly expanding encapsulated mass. The malignant tumor, it has a, a regular shape and surface. The cells are abnormal, irregular size and shape. They're invading the surrounding tissue. They, there's necrosis of the surrounding tissue, so death of that tissue. And um, there's also they also invade the surrounding blood vessels. And so that's one way they can spread. So um, in Table 20.2 from page 550 of the book, um, it basically com uh, compares the characteristics of benign tumors with regard to cells growth, spreading, and their effects. So um, benign tumors, like we said, they're simila similar to normal cells in that they're differentiated and they have fairly normal mitosis except it's just at a faster rate. Malignant tumor cells are varied in size and shape and they often have large nuclei. Um, a lot of them are undifferentiated, meaning they're not performing their function like they're supposed to. And their um, mitosis is increased and it's atypical. So it might not be copying the DNA right because it's going so fast. Um, with benign tumors, they grow relatively slowly. The whole mass expands and they're frequently encapsulated. The malignant tumors grow rapidly. The cells are not adhesive. In other words, they're not sticking together. They can infiltrate the surrounding tissue and they're not encapsulated. So the benign tumors remain localized, but the malignant tumors invade nearby tissues or metastasize to distant sites through the blood and lymph vessels. So um, benign tumors usually do not have systemic effects unless they're in an area um, that affects the rest of the system. Um, so the brain, for example, then they might have systemic effects. Um, with malignant tumors, because they spread so much and affect surrounding tissues, systemic effects are often present. So benign tumors are only life-threatening in certain locations, like the brain, and uh, malignant tumors are often life-threatening because they destroy tissue and they spread. So um, malignant tumors, they not only do they lack control of mitosis, they also don't undergo apoptosis, so they don't die when they're supposed to. Um, they're troublemakers. Um, so there's no normal organization and differentiation. There's no contact inhibition, so they're, they're just going to spread wherever they can. Um, they're abnormal cell membranes and altered surface antigens. 
They don't stick to each other and they often break loose from the mass and that's one way they can invade other tissues and spread to distant sites through the blood or lymph systems. So um, in uh, modalities class, we talk about contraindications. A lot of cancer is a precaution or contraindication for a lot of modalities because um, you don't want to break, you don't want to encourage that things breaking, um, cells breaking loose from the tumor mass and invading other tissues by doing um, soft tissue mobilization and ultrasound and electrical stim you can actually encourage some of that um, spreading and we don't want to do that. Um, the other thing that um, uh, the other thing that we don't want to do is we don't want to um, ch a lot of the modalities will change capillary permeability um, change the vascular and circulation effects in the area. We don't want to give the tumor um, more circulation. So um, a lot of times the uh, tumor mass can compress blood vessels leading to necrosis and inflammation around the tumor. Tumors may secrete enzymes or hormones that um, accelerate the breakdown of proteins in cells and have systemic effects like al altered calcium levels. Um, you can get inflammation and loss of normal cells leading to progressive reduction in the integrity of the organ where the tumor is located and its function. So something like um, pancreatic cancer has a very bad prognosis. One in ten people with pancreatic cancer survive because um, the um, pancreas is so important in its functions and if you um, reduce organ integrity and function, um, that is going to have serious metabolic effects. So um, angiogenesis, which is the um, growth of blood vessels. So some tumor cells secrete growth factors and they stimulate the development of new capillaries in the tumor. So basically they're setting themselves up to hog all the resources in the area by creating these new capillary beds. So warning signs of cancer, um, these, are, these are things that um, we can help educate our patients about. Um, it's, if somebody says, hey, you know, just mentions, well, I've, you know, I've really lost 20 pounds in the last month and I don't know why, that would be a thing like, hey, I, you need to go see your doctor. That, that could be a warning sign. Um, some, some of the other um, warning signs, so we'll just go through them. Unusual bleeding or discharge anywhere in the body. Um, something's wrong. <laughs> you should get that checked out. Change in bowel or bladder habits, like prolonged diarrhea or discomfort, um, or difficulty um, urinating or defecating. Can, um, it can be a neurological problem. Um, like cauda equina syndrome, or it could uh, could be a sign of cancer. So, change in bowel and bladder habits are are something that you definitely want to talk to your primary care physician about. Um, change in a wart or a mole, change in color, size, or shape. That is um, a relevant thing to look into. A sore that doesn't heal on the skin or in the mouth or anywhere really. Um, Non-healing wounds are um, warning signs, not just of cancer, but of other things too. They should be checked out. Unexplained weight loss, like we said. Um, it's one thing if you've been dieting and exercising and trying to lose weight, but if you just are dropping pounds and you don't know why, that's a red flag right there. Um, persistent fatigue, and then it, um, it, that's a, a symptom of anemia or low hemoglobin, because you just don't have enough... Um, red blood cells and oxygen circulating around in your blood and that can cause persistent fatigue. Um, persistent cough or hoarseness without reason. Um, and a solid lump, often painless, in the breasts or testes or anywhere in the body. So new lumps should be checked out. Um, it changes in warts or malls, any of those things can uh, should be checked out. So um, Tumors can have systemic effects, like we were talking about. They can also have local effects. So there isn't often pain associated with a tumor. A lot of times it, you don't get pain until very late stages when the tumor is well advanced. Um, the severity of it can depend on the type of tumor. If it's a very invasive tumor, you might have pain sooner. But um, a lot of times you can't go by pain 
because um, by the time you get pain, the tumor is already um, well advanced. Um, the tumor can obstruct or compress a duct or passageway, and so all of the various ducts and passageways in our body um, can be obstructed by tumors. Blood supply or lymphatic flow may be restricted. The digestive tract can be restricted, or airflow in the bronchi can be restricted. So um, anywhere where there's a tumor, it's not supposed to be there, it, it can um, cause obstruction. So um, tumors can cause tissue necrosis and alteration because they're um, compressing those uh, blood vessels in that area. It can lead to bleeding or infection around the tumor because we're not getting normal blood flow there. So <clears throat> these are pictures from the book with just some um, examples of how a tumor can obstruct a certain area. So those are the local effects of tumors, but um, malignant tumors often have systemic effects. So um, So um, malignant tumors can cause weight, lo um, weight loss and um, cachexia, which is severe tissue wasting. Um, it can, there can be increased demands on the body from um, tumor cells, because those guys are, are nutrient hogs. Um, it can cause um, anorexia, fatigue, pain, and stress, um, just the additional stress on the body. Um, anemia can be caused by blood loss at the tumor site, so you're um, losing, because of the tissue necrosis and destruction at the site, you can lose blood and that can cause anemia. And nutritional deficits can also reduce hemoglobin synthesis. Um, severe fatigue can be caused by inflammatory changes, the, the tissue wasting and anemia. Um, it can be caused by stress of the cancer treatment schedule or by psychological factors. I mean, it can just... Um, really take a toll on you knowing that you have this malignant tumor. So um, it can also cause fluid buildup in body cavities or effusions um, because of the inflammation caused by the tumor. And um, infections can occur frequently because your, resist your resistance is lower because um, it's trying to fight that extra tumor. Um, tumor cells can erode the blood vessels, causing bleeding. That extra bleeding can cause anemia, like we said earlier. Um, the perineoplastic syndrome is associated with certain tumor types, where the tumor cells release substances that affect neurological function and can have hormonal effects. So the tumors actually start sending out chemical signals um, that are acting on other areas of the body as well. Um, that's the perineoplastic syndrome. So, for diagnostic tests, um, routine screening for early detection is really important because the earlier you detect it, the better. The, more, the better chance you have of doing something about it if it's in the earlier stages. And then, um, so self-exams, breast and testicular and skin exams are important because early detection is, is um, the best way. And if you do it consistently, you'll know um, what's how your body is and what needs to be done. Um, there are blood tests that um, they'll do during treatment where they measure blood cell levels and there are blood tests that can detect tumor markers like the PSA test which um, detects tumor markers for colon cancer. Um, ultrasound, MRI, CT scans, those are all done. Um, they use it to visualize changes in tissues or organs. Um, mammograms are important. Um, getting regular mammograms for um, prevention, you know, to catch it early if necessary. Um, cytological tests require biopsy or cell sample. So histological and cytological exams determine the degree of differentiation in the tumor type. Um, sometimes um, if you have a tumor on the surface, of course, like a skin tumor, um, they can they can tell the tumor type from looking at it. But if you have an internal tumor, they have to do a biopsy 
to figure out what's going on. They can also test the cells um, to see what their um, what is promoting their growth, what makes them grow more or grow less. So there are some tumors that respond to certain hormones like estrogen, um, and so they can test their sensitivities when they do the cytological tests. And it's considered to be the most dependable confirmation of malignancy because they can really look at the cells under the microscope and see what's going on with them. So um, malignant tumors, they spread either by invasion or metastasis. So invasion is a local spread where the um, tumor cells grow into adjacent tissues. So um, the example that they give in the book is the uterine carcinoma that invades the vagina. Um, or tumors that invade surrounding lymph nodes. That's another one that's common. Um, when they spread by metastasis, they spread to different sites via the blood or lymph or other body fluids. So like a colon cancer spreading to the liver via the blood. So um, they, they classify cancer by stages um, so they can, they can sort of come up with what, how aggressive they need to be with treatment, what your local outcome, what your likely outcome is going to be. They use staging to estimate your prognosis because they want to tell people um, how likely is it that you're going to recover from this, and and if you have cancer, you want to know. Um, so the most common system they used is the TMN system. So T is the size of the primary tu um, tumor, M is the spread or metastasis of the tumor, and N is the involvement of regional lymph nodes. So um, the uh, process, the carcinogenesis is like the creation of cancer. It's the process that, that normal cells um, go through to be transformed into cancer cells. And it um, varies a lot. Some of them are really slow, some of them are faster. Um, so in terms of the cause of disease, cancer is considered to be multifactorial. And because it, cancer can be affected, if, can affect a lot of different sites, there are a lot of different things that can cause it. So environmental effects can be part of the cause. Change in gene expression. So whatever genes are um, activated or deactivated, expressed or not expressed, or infection in some cases, like cervical cancer and hepatic cancer um, caused from um, human papillomavirus or um, hepatitis virus infections. Um, some cancers have well-established risk factors, like breast cancer is one of the ones that has well-established risk, risk factors. So the initiating factors of carcinogenesis, um, there are pro-carcinogens which cause the first irreversible changes in cellular DNA. They don't create an active neoplasm, but they cause the change in the DNA that is eventually going to create the neoplasm. So it might be something like um, UV exposure to UV light, um, exposure to other types of radiation, um, so what that does is it changes the cellular DNA to the point where it's initiating um, those irreversible changes. Um, exposure to promoters like hormones and environmental chemicals. Um, so the change in the DNA from the initiating factors there and the promoters cause further changes in the DNA. So there's um, less different cell differentiation or an increased rate of mitosis or lack of programmed cell death. Um, dysplasia and anaplasia may be evident, so either no cell growth or weird cell growth, um, dysfunctional cell growth, um, and that process leads to tumor development. So risk factors um, genetic factors, they've um, identified a lot of genes that they call oncogenes that regulate the growth of a tumor. Um, so the, they've actually identified some genes that will predict whether or not a tumor will metastasize. Um, so that's pretty interesting that they can do that. 
Um, viruses called oncoviruses alter this, the host cell's DNA to the point where it's creating that um, situation where a tumor can grow. Um, UV rays, x-rays and gamma rays, radioactive isotopes. Um, so with all of those things, the risk of um, carcinogenesis is increased with higher cumulative dosage. So um, it's not just like one dosage and then it dissipates, it's cumulative over time. Chemicals. Um, like organic solvents, asbestos, heavy metals, formaldehyde, and chemotherapy agents can be, um, exposure to those can be a risk factor. And um, biological factors like chronic irritation, inflammation, um, advancing age, unfortunately, predisposes you to cancer. Um, certain dietary um, things can predispose you to cancer and hormones. So, how can we reduce the risk? There's some things we can't control. There's some things we can control. So limited UV exposure from sun or tanning booths. We can we can do that. Um, regular medical and dental examination. So if if we do develop um, cancer, we can catch it early. Uh, regular self-examination. Um, diet. Increase fiber content. Reduce fats. Uh, lots of fruits and vegetables because fruits and vegetables contain antioxidants which reduce changes in the DNA. So um, cell mediated immunity, which we talked about last quarter in the immune system, recognizes some tumor cells and destroys them. And our natural killer cells also recognize some tumor cells and destroy them. So um, there is immunization available for cervical cancer and hepatitis. Um, the, they're recommended to reduce risk, um, cancer risk from infection. So um, as a healthcare professional, it's definitely a good idea to get um, the hepatitis vaccines. Um, cervical uh, HPV vaccines, um, they, they have to be taken when you're young. Um, so when you're 11 or 12 years old, that's when you have to take them. It's too late for all of us, but um, the upcoming generations can benefit from that.